Today we head back to August the 11th, 1982, and the funeral of Violet Cray, the mother of Britain's two most feared gangsters of all time, the Cray Twins. The first public appearance in 13 years of the notorious Cray Twins allowed out of prison for their mother's funeral. By the time of their mother's death, Ronnie and Reggie Cray were both serving life sentences for murder, and Ronnie was an inmate in a secure institution for the criminally insane. And yet their extraordinary life of crime and vicious brutality had also seen them socialising with London's elite. The twins were already urban legends. Inevitably, there was certain tension at this extraordinary funeral, but there was not a hint of trouble. The funeral cortege arrived at the church in spectacular style with a convoy of black limousines. It was like royalty being buried. You had these crowds and crowds of people. Maureen Flanagan knew the Cray's extremely well. She'd been Mrs. Cray's hairdresser for the past 20 years. I was standing outside the church and then a van pulled up, prison van. Today, Reggie was flanked by detectives. He's still classed as a Category A prisoner. He got out of this van and I heard a cheer go up, people shouting out, Reg, Reg, I'm over here, look, it's Sally, or it's Tom, or it's... And his hair was starting to um, go grey, so he looked very, very distinguished and waving like, like the Queen Mother. Ronnie Cray arrived handcuffed to a prison officer. He spent the last four years having mental treatment in Broadmoor Prison Hospital. Then I saw Ronnie coming towards me. Then I heard even more, like screaming, free Ronnie Cray, free Reggie Cray. This is at the mother's funeral. It turned into a little bit of a circus. The Crays were identical twins, born within 10 minutes of each other and inseparable as children, playing on the World War II bomb sites of London's heavily damaged East End. They both excelled at boxing as teenagers, winning awards, as did their older brother Charlie. And in 1961, it was he that first asked the newly qualified and glamorous hairdresser Maureen to pay weekly visits to their mother to do her hair. And I knocked at the door and that's where I met this woman that was really to change my life. It was a come in, darling, do you want a cup of tea? A typical little East End mum she was, who was small and blonde and very cheerful and accommodating, welcoming to people. And I just felt at ease. And um, I noticed that all around this kitchen was hanging on hangers, these pure white washed and ironed and stark shirts. And I said, you know, what, who are all these shirts for? So they're for my twins. The Crays were famously always well-dressed, and by the early 60s, they already owned a couple of nightclubs, including in the fashionable West End. But their business ventures weren't all legitimate. Well, Reggie could always tell if there'd be a bad day. And so if... If he knew Ronnie was going somewhere, he made sure he arrived within 10, 15 minutes because he knew he was going to be in a vicious, dreadful, violent mood. And in those moods, he could only be controlled by Violet, his mother, or Reggie on some occasions, but nobody else. He was going to one, didn't he? You couldn't hear what he was saying. I burnt all my eyebrows off of me. But I said, I'm nearly blind in that eye. And almost deaf in that ear, because... Then he went and got an hammer. You know what they beat state with, them hammers? And he smashed me in the ear and got my eardrum and all the blood come out, like, you know. You know, I've been in pubs in the East End with some really, really hard men and he'd walk in and I'd see men put their drinks down and leave. They'd looked at him and seen what mood he was in. Hard men who, hard you men. know, mm. done some time in prison, prison? probably... Were terrified. Yet, they were terrified mm. of them. Were terrified because there was... Um, no ending to his violence. Something started him off. He'd walk into a pub and he'd see two guys laughing. They could have been laughing five minutes before he walked in and he'd picked up a glass and smashed it into their face and they weren't laughing at him whatsoever. The police were already on the trail of the craze but even as they gathered evidence against them, the twins enjoyed a celebrity status, even giving interviews to the press about, ironically, the problem with ruffians in their nightclubs. A lot of people have got the impression from this trial that clubland, London, is very tough. Do you think it is? You run a couple of clubs. Well, in all clubs, you get an occasional drunk, you know, and sometimes they have to be slung out, and that's why there's dorm in there. But um, I suppose it's nightclub land all over the world, really. It's just the same as 
I don't suppose it can be that bad. Most people wouldn't go to them, really, would they? Ronald, what do you think about Clubland in London? Well, I think most clubs are very respectable, you know, and uh, I don't think there's any trouble at all in them, except occasionally. In fact, the truth was terrifying. Only later would victims of their aggression feel able to speak publicly about it. I walked into a kitchen. Ronnie was standing opposite me as I walked in. Well, when he turned, that's when I see these pokers. He had them on the gas. Anyway, he'd come over with the poker and he started burning me hair off. And he went back, got another one off, and he held it across my eyes there. He said, now I'm going to burn your f***ing eyes out. And uh, someone at the back, they just shouted out, no, Ron, not that. And he just, like that, switched off. He walked away. Reggie had taken him to a Harley Street specialist that put him on certain tablets, which sometimes he took and sometimes he didn't, when he'd had a terrible outburst and probably did a terrible feat of violence. Reggie probably persuaded him to go back on the pills. And they were as vicious as one another. People say that Ronnie was always more violent. He was more violent because he was more violent more times than Reggie. And were you ever scared being in that environment? Never. Nobody ever sort of walked around the East End saying, you know, Ronnie Cray's gay man who wouldn't dare say it. He had told Charlie, his elder brother, who was probably a little bit disgusted, really. Ronnie said, our mother's been told she's accepted it. If she's accepted it, you can accept it. So <laughs> that was the end of that conversation. But he was always surrounded with young guys. You never, ever saw Ronnie Cray touch the boy he was out with or a kiss on the cheek. No way could you touch Ronnie Cray while you were out in public. He'd kiss me on the cheek like he did the mother, but he never would kiss a man, not in public. Was Reggie ever involved in a gay relationship? He was inclined to be bisexual until he met Francis. Do you ever think of turning them into the police? No, never. That would make me an informant that was um, totally against their way of life and also against my way of life. And that was the problem the police had. No one would inform on the craze, even when Ronnie openly shot a man in the head in a pub. In front of at least seven people, that was the audacity of the crime. But no one would tell the police. Not one of those seven people, the poor barmaid. She kept silent for a year. She went on an identification parade and Ronnie was on the identity. And he just stared at her with that stare where well, you can imagine there's nobody in their right mind who would have said, yes, that's him. Eventually, the police did catch up with the craze, building a strong enough case to convict them of three murders. Some suspect there were more. Inspector Leonard Nipper Reed was the man to finally put the handcuffs on. It was 6.30 in the morning. They were asleep. Ronnie was in bed with a boy. Reggie was in bed with a girl. It's like a Robin Hood thing, isn't it? You know, um, they were against authority and they were vicious and I've got to call them murderers.